All right, let's uh, get started. A few people might come in a little bit late here. Let's finish Isaiah, and uh, I want to focus on uh, here in uh, chapter 65, beginning in verse 17. The new heavens and new earth um, theology. I think Isaiah is the one that lays the foundation theologically. You know, we can go back to Genesis 2, chap verses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, we don't turn there, but just as a way of reminder, from the very beginning, thank you, sir. From the very beginning, we have Moses, who is uh, setting up the theological foundation for Israel in the day that Yahweh God made the heavens and earth. First time that we see the word or the covenant name for God as Yahweh shows up in Genesis 2.4. But I think that it's theologically emphatic that Moses is establishing not only God as creator, Yahweh as creator, but Yahweh as king. So that we get that from the very beginning. But now that's where it goes, because here in chapter 65, let's look beginning in verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So this is the new heaven and new earth. And at the center of this new heaven and new earth will be the new Jerusalem. Notice in verse 18. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for glad gladness. So as we've heard before time, this will be a time of rejoicing and peace. Um, you see that in verse 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. There will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. No longer will be there in, in, in an infant who only lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his many days. For the youth will die at an age of 100 and one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought accursed. Now, I know that, you know, does that mean that we're only going to live to be 100 at this time? No, I think the fullness of the what we understand now with the coming of Christ, the resurrected bodies, death will no longer, so the curse of death will, will, will no longer be. So, I, But I just think that's a way of describing some of the effects of sin, like, you know, disease and some of those things will, those things won't even be part of the new heaven and new earth. So that's what I think. Um, with that, just in case somebody wants to ask that question. And in, in, to this future audience, Isaiah is going to deposit one more significant truth, and we, we turn over to chapter 66, verses 1 and 2. And here we have the final emphasis, and uh, this kind of connects us back to the very beginning. Verse 1 in chapter 66, thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house for you? Uh, who, where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? So this is, uh, and down through verse 2a, for my hand made all of these things. Thus, all these things came into being, declares the Lord. So there again, we've got God is on his throne, right? And the Lord, yeah. I got a question. Okay. I don't really, again, I don't really follow my footnote too much, but. It talks about, you know, when you talk about death. Yes. It talks about that being like the millennial kingdom and how it's a tempor like the temporary uh, phase of the kingdom. In, in terms of uh, what verse are you referring to? Verse 2, 5, 20. It only just says, Long life will prevail in the millennial kingdom. Yes. The temporal phase of the kingdom, death will happen, but not, not near this or early in the time of well, I just think verse 20 is just putting it into words. In other words, our present experience, um, you know, seeing that there's an older man who doesn't live out his days or a, an infant that dies in, uh, at, a, at a young age, those are not the things that we're going to see. I think that's a way of saying those things aren't going to be part of our uh, experience um, um, in, in the New heavens and new earth. I think that's what. So this is more the new heaven, not the millennial, right? Um, because that's why I'm confused. Well, I'm. I'm. The Bible says millennial, but a thousand-year rule. I 
guess. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, there's a thousand year rule that leads up to the establishment of the new heaven and new earth. We'll get into that a little bit when we study the book of Daniel and some more specifics on how the timetable kind of fills in. But by Isaiah, we're not getting all of those details. So you're reading, you're trying to read Isaiah through the prophet Daniel or the book of Revelation, which is no, no, we're not supposed to do that. Just let the text speak on its own terms. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just cross it out. Yeah, here, use this double thick wide black marker. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Now we'll get to that uh, when we get to. Uh, so let's uh, let's see where were we. Um, so one of the things that uh, you know m may have been true for for this group with regards. Well, let's see. I got distracted there. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the temple. The temple has some emphasis in here in chapter 66. There's a few details here in chapter 66, verse two. Um, but to this one, I will look to him who is humble. Okay, wait a minute. Um, 66.2. Yeah, the question that's asked in verse 1 in chapter 66. Where then is a house you could build for me? Where then is a house you could build for me? So in this future, new heaven, new earth, what do we think about the throne of God? Well, what's the answer? Here it is. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. So that kind of the idea is, it's not all about a temple built with human hands, right? We've got this, this is, you know, God's rule and reign is in the human heart. It's, it's where the humble heart resides. It's the heart of obedience is where um, that seems to be the emphasis. And interestingly, if we would go back to... Uh, you know, someplace uh, a prophet like Haggai, chapter 2, verses 3 through 9, at a time when God's people who had come back from the exile to rebuild the temple, they, they, they're all standing around and they're kind of discouraged. The emphasis is the same. It's not about this, this building. You know, where God resides with his people is with the faithful remnant, with those whose heart is humble, with those whose heart is obedient and inclined to uh, revere and honor the Lord. So that's kind of a, a little emphasis there. So finally, God is coming as, as king to rule, establish his kingdom, gather the nations, invite, and, and invite them to join in the activities of Zion, Isaiah chapter 66. Let's uh, finish there. Isaiah chapter 66, beginning in verse 18, down through 20. Let's see. Could I have a Taylor? Why don't you read that for us? Isaiah chapter 66, 18 through 20. Knowing their works and their thoughts, I have come together all nations and languages. They will come and see my glory. I will establish a sign among them, and I will send survivors from them to the nations to Tarshish, put wood, all um, who are archers to Baal, Javan, and the islands far away, who have not heard of my fame or seen my glory, and they will proclaim my glory among the nations. They will bring all your brothers from all the nations as a gift to the Lord on horses and chariots, and litters, and on mules and camels, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring an offering and a clean vessel to the house of the Lord. Okay, so again, it's involving the nations to this holy mountain, Jerusalem. You see that there in verse 20. So again, just as a way of reminder, if I'm reading my Old Testament the way that Jesus or Paul would have read their Old Testament, the Bible of the day, before the New Testament even been written, remember I've made this big deal about how the Hebrew Bible ends. Remember that? And if we turn to Second Chronicles, just as a way of, uh, of a connecting point, Chronicles represents the last book in the Hebrew canon. It's like the book of Revelation. So for all of the faithful remnant who have been reading their Bible all through this whole period, they turn to Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 36, and the very last word that they read is the Cyrus decree cut in half. <laughs> right at the word and let them go up. 
And I've made the case before. I think the author of Chronicles, who's one of the last participating authors of those authors adding to the canon, the author of Chronicles is, is also writing to this group of exiles who have come back, those who have come back to Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding their covenant community. And just like the prophets, this is an invitation to the day of the Lord, I think. One of these days when I have time, I'm going to write an article about this, but it's an invitation. Let them go up. Where? To Zion. To do what? Well, read the prophets and find out. Nations will be going there and participating. The king will reign and rule and establish his kingdom, the new creation, the new heaven, the new earth, and all of that. That's the invitation to go up, to meet the king, to participate in the day of the Lord activities and all of that. So... All right, well, we're going to end Isaiah. We're going to move to a blank screen, and there's our deep thought picture for the next prophet. See it? Micah. Micah, there he is. And there's judgment in the book of Micah, as well as the sun that's rising, which kind of signifies what, Kelsey? The sun rising, the day. It's a new day. Day of the Lord. Yeah, the day of the Lord. So so Micah is a lot like Isaiah. It's very. He's a very similar. He's kind of like a, you can think of the book of Micah as a condensed version of the whole book of Isaiah. He's like a mini Isaiah. Interestingly, his name means who is like Yahweh, Micah. Um, so that, that there's overlap with the prophet Micah in terms of the historical time span uh, with Isaiah as an active prophet. Um, interestingly, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 26, even mentions Micah as an active prophet. We have a little bit of a mention of him in chapter 26, beginning in verse 18. And he mentions him in verse 18. Micah of Moresheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. So that's in the controversy there with Jeremiah, but they're quoting, referring back to the act of prophet Micah. So that's an interesting. Um, so giving the heading of the book, Micah's prophecy is going to overlap three kings in Judah. And uh, let's turn to Micah in the very first chapter, first verse. I wasn't there yet, sorry. Micah, Micah. And you see the overlap. There's the reference to three kings of Judah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Ezekiah, kings of Judah. And because of the reference there to King Hezekiah, like Isaiah, remember that Isaiah overlaps a lot, and we saw all the details of the overlap of the, of the act of prophet Isaiah encouraging King Hezekiah during what was called the Sennacherib crisis. When the Assyrian... Uh, king Sennacherib starts to come down and starts to put the pressure on 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 Israel in the north and when Samaria falls the pressure continues to come down uh, and we'll see some slides here in a little bit that kind of show you Sennacherib's uh, campaign against Judah so this is the Sennacherib crisis and uh, Micah again is right on top of all of this as well in and around 701 BC so uh, Micah is going to be contemporary with the uh, eventual fall of Samaria. So he's going to be uh, uh, there as an active prophet uh, in, in and around 722 as well, when Samaria, the capital city of, his, of Israel, falls. What's interesting here, his hometown is, is referred to there, Moresheth. And there it is, uh, right there. And just it's just an interesting picture. I, I, I saw this on a, on a Google search, and I wanted to include it. So all of these very important small towns are all south of Jerusalem. Do you all see that in the slide? But notice all of the significant people who have come from these small little towns. You've got a lot of prophets in and around uh, Tekoa. There's Amos, his hometown. You've got Moresheth Gath, that's Micah, and his hometown in there. Uh, just south of Jerusalem, you've got Bethlehem. Isaiah's coming from Jerusalem. Uh, direct, but Bethlehem would be the the hometown of uh, Boaz, 
right? And eventually we get to King David. Yeah, King David. And all of these are significant. But it's all, all in and around. I call that the Bible Belt kind of uh, per se. It's interesting, you know, and all of this activity. And this is kind of the, this kind of the center of, you know, it seems to be God's calling these individuals. Well, in, interestingly, each one of these prophets, and if you look at Boaz and, and King David, they had preparation before God tapped them on the shoulder and called them to do something. And my hunch is we have some clues, but not, you know, I have to kind of speculate a bit. But they're all growing up in these small towns, whether they're, whether I'm a prophet Micah or, or Amos or Hosea. I, I cut my teeth in these small towns, these small country churches. They're praying grandmas. I'd see them and walking down the streets. They would remind me of God's truth. Somebody prepared King David to know what to do when he ran out on the battlefield. He knew how to trust in the Lord, even though King Saul didn't, right? He got his preparation, cutting his teeth, going out, taking care of the family flocks. Absolutely, he knew how to get a lot of practice using the sling. But even more importantly, somebody had taught him correct theology before he took on the Philistine giant. So that's my hunch. All of this, that kind of activity is going on in and around this, this center of activity in Judah. So, uh, so now getting back to Micah. Let's see. Damien, could I have you read Micah chapter 1, verses 2? I'm going to give you a lot. That's okay. 2 through 9. All right. Listen, all you peoples. Pay attention, earth, and everyone in it. The Lord God be a witness against you. The Lord from his holy temple. Look, the Lord is leaving his place and coming down to trample the heights of the earth. The mountains will melt beneath him and the valleys will split apart like wax near the fire, like water cascading down a mountainside. All this will happen because of Jacob's rebellion and the sins of the house of Israel. What is the rebellion of Jacob? Isn't it Samaria? And what is the high places of Judah? Isn't it Jerusalem? I will make Samaria a heap of ruins in the countryside, a planting area for a vineyard. I will roll her stones into the valley and expose her foundations. All of her carved images will be smashed to pieces. All her wages will be buried in the fire, will be burned in the fire, and I will destroy all of her idols. Since she collected the wages of a prostitute, they will be used again for a prostitute. You said all the way down to nine? Yeah, down to nine. Hmm? Because of this, I will lament and wail. I will walk barefoot naked. I will howl like the jackal, like the jackals, and mourn like the ostriches. For her wounds is incurable and has reached even Judah. It has approached the gate of my people as far as Jerusalem. I mean, that's his whole message there in a nutshell. You, you, you've got to kind of fill in a little bit of the prophetic, uh, poetic language here. But here what we've got is, you know, this is a warning of the growing, impending Assyrian threat. This is what Micah is, is getting from the Lord. And this is really, you have to understand that while he's prophesying, and he, he's referring to Samaria and the sins of Israel in the north, and what God is going to do in allowing the Assyrians to come down and ransack and destroy eventually the capital city, Samaria, he's also speaking to Judah. And he's saying, we have to get our act together. If this is what's happening in Samaria, what will happen to us unless we get our act together? So he, it's just a call to repent. Um, and this is part of Micah's strategy. So he's, he's recognizing the changing world events that will eventually lead to the fall of Samaria the Sennacherib crisis will continue to put pressure on Judah and her kings. But you know what? What do, what do God's people need to do in response? They need to repent. They need to clean the house away from all of these idols and the idolatry and this, these references to being a prostitute and the, pro, the spiritual prostitution that Judah and Jerusalem is responsible for. What's interesting that we have uh, another uh, in verse 9. This Reference in verse 9 to the incurable wound. It's not going to go away. Well, what is the wound? 
the combination of, well, I guess we can kind of think about it. The wound, is, it's an infection, and how is it going to be responded to? For it has come to Judah, and it has reached the gate of my people, the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. So remember, Jerusalem's a walled city, and you've got this gate. So what's this wound that's approaching? It's the Assyrians, or, or eventually it'll be the Babylonians for Judah. But any, anyway, this wound, it's eventually going to reach the gate. Sennacherib did, and in his own words, if you remember, he gets as far as Jerusalem, right? Do you remember that? So he did reach the gate, but that's where it stopped for, for King Sennacherib. Remember we talked about that. And this is in his own words, King Sennacherib, on the, Taylor, or the Sennacherib prism, I shut him up like a caged bird in his royal city of Jerusalem. So that lines up well with what Micah is saying here. Sennacherib and his army uh, gets all the way up to the gate of Jerusalem, but that's where, the, that's where it's stalled. Because of the divine intervention, because the Lord heard the prayer of King Hezekiah. Do you remember that? We talked about that. So it really lines up well, I think. Uh, you see the prophetic strategy at work in places like verses uh, 5 through 7. Um, and, and the details there. Micah is going to identify, uh, as for the sins of the house of Israel, you know, what is the rebellion of Jacob or Judah? Is it not Samaria? In other words, he's making the case that our brothers to the north in Israel, their, their sin is bringing this about on their heads. Micah is making the point, where our sins no different. We're still about doing the same things down here. Do you think God's going to, how's God going to respond to us any differently? See that? So this is his prophetic, uh, his prophet strategy. Um, and like, like if we read in Isaiah chapter 2 through 3, this idea of here is a prophet going, uh, prepared to go to the extreme to get the attention of his people. Down in verse 8, because of this, I must lament and wail and must go barefoot and naked. If you're going to, Get somebody's attention in downtown Fort Worth about uh, the sins of the city, and you you're the one called by God to, to do this. You know, you think you're going to get a you know turn a few heads running around downtown Fort Worth naked, barefoot, and wailing. Um, it's interesting this this language of wailing. Uh, it's described. I must make a lament like jackals, like uh, the jackals. Probably see the. Uh, Nature specials, you know, the, the howling jackals at night, the hyenas, the hyenas, how they sound from a distance. But interestingly, in the morning, like the ostriches, I bet nobody knows the sound that an ostrich makes. Do, 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 do you know the sound of an ostrich? You, you've probably seen this before, haven't you? Yeah, you've seen this. I'll try to play it here. You've got to be quiet to, to hear it. Yeah, you never heard that's yeah. That's the sound an ostrich makes. That's what's being that's what that's why he's referring to the mourning like an ostrich. Yeah. It's a strange thing, isn't it? But it would have been understood. You gotta understand the prophet Mike is putting it in terms that the people of his you know, his audience would have understood. Everybody knows back then anyway, the sound that an ostrich makes. So, uh, like what we've seen before, I put Micah. Critical scholars will do something similar with the prophet like Micah, and they'll kind of want to, their tendency is to kind of break him up or break his book up into any way two parts, not three, like what we saw with Isaiah, Isaiah 1, 2, and 3, but Micah 1 and 2. So the first three chapters, the real Micah, the prophetic active prophet, is responsible for chapters 1 through 3, but because 4 through 7 kind of has that focus on the exilic or post-exilic audience, we really have to take those words out of the prophet's mouth, come up with some other unknown, unnamed prophet active later in history in and around that exilic or in right at the end or the post-exilic period. But see, I'm going to apply the same strategy, as you probably would anticipate, that we have to allow Micah to hear from the eternal vantage point, we have to allow the prophet Micah to hear from the Lord and anticipate uh, not just his present audience, but also anticipate this future audience as well. 
That's the prophetic job. That's what they're active doing. So uh, we'll just move on. So, um, and like what we've seen with uh, Isaiah, Micah too is going to have this particular interest with the nations of the world. And uh, the nations themselves will be summoned to be witnesses of God's judgment. Uh, and we saw that in Micah chapter 1, verse 2. Hear, O peoples, all of you. Listen, O earth, and all it contains. And let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So the summons is for the nations. The nations are to know that with divine judgment, this, this judgment from God against his own people, that the, the nations will also be um, involved in the same kind of judgment. Not only the judgment against them, but the nations also, according to Micah, will also be involved in the future restoration. And uh, this is the similar message that we saw in Isaiah chapter 2, but I'll jump ahead a little bit in Micah chapter 4. Let's see here. Trevor, could I have you, did I have you read before? No. Okay. Could you read in chapter 4, verses 1 through, through 4? Uh, 1 through 3. 1 through what? Chapter 4, 1 through 3. Micah. It shall come to pass in the later days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of the Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord uh, from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many people, and shall decide for strong nations uh, far away, and shall beat their swords into the plowshares, and the spears into uh, pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up swords against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. Okay, so there's the emphasis again on the nations participating, going up to Zion, and being involved in all of the activity. The Lord will be delivering the words of Torah and instruction, They'll be receiving that, but also receiving also the blessings that the Lord provides. And we start to see this picture emerge in Micah, like what we've seen before um, in Isaiah and other places. Um, it's important that, to remind ourselves that we are the ones, we're part of those who will be grafted in, according to uh, what Paul writes in Romans chapter 11 and some of that language in terms of the vine. Um, we're grafted into this promise and what the future holds there. And uh, I had my, we talked a little bit about it before, but the interesting thing to me is there seems to be this idea that the ethnicity of the nations seems to be, I think, although it's debated, but preserved with this picture that emerges. So real nations will be intact and coming and streaming up to Mount Zion and, you know, as part of that future day, uh, we'll be participating shoulder to shoulder according to a passage that we looked at in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8 and 11. All right, so we'll move on, and um, here's the picture that I wanted to show you. In chapter 1, starting in verse uh, uh, 3 and all the way down to verse 16, we read that before, so we won't read it again, but it seems to start to anticipate the fall of Samaria. And also the Sennacherib crisis of 701 B.C. So all the way down in chapter 1, verse 3, all the way down to verse 16, there's this growing crisis starting with the Assyrians who, who destroy Samaria, exile the people, and continue to put that pressure on. So here it is in a kind of a, a, a geography of the Sennacherib crisis. What Sennacherib does is start to put the pressure on after he takes out Samaria in the north, he continues down along the Philistine coast. You see he's kind of taking out Philistine cities first uh, along the uh, Philistine area. And then eventually he gets down to Lachish, way down on the bottom part. You see the, the city of Lachish is a, is a Judah city. Uh, and when that gets destroyed, here's what's interesting. The warpath starts up through that Remember that earlier uh, slide where I showed you Micah's hometown of Moorish Gash, Gath? Morris 
Morshef uh, Gath is right along that path. So it could be, it might be uh, interesting to think that um, Micah's hometown was right on the Assyrian attack path as they're making their way up to Jerusalem. So Micah's right involved in you know this whole Sennacherib crisis firsthand. We don't have any of the extra details from the text uh, in terms of Sennacherib boasting about taking out the small little town of was probably not even of, a, of an interest to the Assyrian army, to be honest. I mean, they may have gone past it, may have gone through, picked up lunch along the way, you know, as they're building their siege ramps against Jerusalem. So, uh, inter, you know, it's interesting anyway. Um, chapter 1, verse 12 uh, is of interest. Um, and let's read that one. Uh, let's see here. I'll just read it here. Chapter 1, verse 12. For the inhabitant of Maroth becomes weak, waiting for good, because a calamity or an adversity has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Now what's interesting about that is what's come up to the gate of Jerusalem, right? Do we already know the answer to that? This, yeah, the Assyrians. Now, what Micah is doing here is, um, is it's, and what's interesting about this particular verse is that we see the kind of the playoff of good and adversity in this one verse. In other words, if I'm on the wall of Jerusalem and I'm looking out and I see the Assyrian army planning their strategy against me, I'm asking this question. What's good about this? <laughs> this is growing adversity right out here outside the walls of Jerusalem, you know? And in fact, the reinforced walls, do you remember what Hezekiah does? He reinforces the walls. Pardon? Yeah, he reinforced, he tore down the poor. And Isaiah kind of uh, criticized him about that. It's not trusting in the Lord. But what's interesting about this, Micah's charge here is that the good will not come until the adversity is first embraced. Remember Isaiah says, you know, I, I made the point that exile and adversity comes before salvation. So we see the same kind of thing kind of uh, expanded here from Micah. And, 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 you know, it's not unlike what we saw, and I think I've referred back to, for example, in the book of Job. You know, this idea that, um, oops, for the there we go. Job chapter 2, and his question in verse 10, when he's responding to his wife, and here we have an individual who is faced with this off-the-charts adversity, Job, the one who's suffering, he says, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? So in the situation that Job has, you know, in a way it's the same kind of picture. Adversity first, salvation comes. You've got to wait. Uh, lamentations. Let's turn there really quick. Um, and in this, this case, again, Jeremiah is helping a group of people work through their grief. And he asked the same question down in, uh, there it is, in, in verse... Uh, there we go, 38, in chapter 3. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High, El Elyon, that both good and, I'll say, adversity go forth? You see the same question popping up along the way. And one of the things that the prophets are wrestling with, or helping their audience wrestle with, are we just inside this walled city thinking that because of our sins, we're not going to have to go through some adversity? In other words, God's getting our attention through adversity with the ultimate outcome, that is, the repentance of God's people. That's the, that's the end game. The prophets are trying to push, push the people to, to repent. So Micah recognizes that uh, a, you know, Lachish has fallen. This is a city of Judah that's fallen. Um, and the sins, the sins that we're committing, there, ergo, are no different than what we, what we know was going on up in, in Israel, in, in Samaria. Verse 13. 
Harness the chariot to the team of horses, O inhabitant of Lachish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, because in you were found the rebellious acts of Israel. That's interesting. So this continuity of sin is, is you know, what's happened at Lachish. Well, what were they doing? Well, they were sinning like the Israelites. They were sinning like those in Samaria. And what, look what's happened to them. The Assyrians came down, destroyed Samaria, and continuing to put pressure. The Philistine cities have fallen, and now Lachish has fallen. That's a city that's in Judah. You know, it's that kind of development. So you see the progression and the strategy that, that we have going on. And this is a picture of what's, what's basically, of, of what's, what's yet to come for us. The prophet Micah knows this. He's bubbling forth, you know. He's that shaken bottle of Coke that, you know, the pressure's got to go. He's got to speak. And the prophet Micah, um, you know, but, the, but, but to the one that does not wait for the good, but accepts the adversity as from the Lord, uh, notice where this encouragement goes. In other words, if we embrace this, and recognize that the adversity is what the Lord has brought our way, and we embrace that, what's going to happen? It's interesting, Micah chapter 2. Um, and this is what he has intended for the righteous remnant. See, the righteous remnant would have understood, well, you know, this is God's judgment coming our way, and we're going to have to accept this and embrace this for a time. But notice what he does in encouraging this group. Um, verse chapter 2, verse 12. I will surely assemble all of you, Jacob. Jacob is a reference here to Judah. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in the midst of its pasture. Then They will be noisy with the men. So this is like the gathering. Notice the, the emphasis on the first person singular pronoun. You see the I, I, I. Who's the one that's kind of allowing this gathering of those in Judah to take place? I refers to the Lord. You know, this is the Lord. But notice how the Lord is also at work. Verse 13. The breaker goes up before them. They break out, pass through the gate, and go out by it. So their king goes on before them. And the Lord is at their head. Now that's kind of subtle, but it, you've got a picture that the break in the wall and the exiles will be taken out in single file to a location. But who's in the front of the line? Who? It's the Lord. He's, he's, the Lord is at their head. So in other words, the faithful remnant are being encouraged, beginning with Micah. This is going to happen. It's inevitable if, unless the people repent, which is, does not look good right now. It may be that God's plan A is for you to go into exile. But know this, the Lord is at the head. He's still sovereign. He's still king. He's still in control. And he has a plan for you because he's not leaving you. He's walking with you. If you go into exile, the Babylon. We're going to eventually see this, this uh, anticipation of the Babylonians who will be coming, and they're the next to Syria for Judah. But when they take you into exile, know that the Lord is sovereign over all of this activity. And that's what the I, I, I of verse 12 is. And we connect that to the Lord is at their head. So this full picture of God's sovereignty, even in the midst of the adversity, that's why we have to embrace it. See, that's why... Before the good comes, we have to em em embrace the adversity. Kind of like Job, kind of like Jeremiah writing in Lamentations chapter 3 and, and, and this good adversity kind of uh, dilemma. All right, well, that's just a little theological aside. Now, there's similarities of Micah with other prophets that have come before, like our good friend Amos. Do you remember his uh, attack of the fat cows of Bashan? Remember that the conversation? Chapter 4 in Amos, we won't turn there, but the fat cows represented the wealthy elite of Israel at the time, and they were involved in injustice, taking advantage of the poor and the needy, the orphans, the widows, and the community. 
building their wealth on the backs of the poor. All of that was part of the prophetic message. Notice what Micah says in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I mean, actually, I want to, Seth, why don't you read it? You read it, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob. You're reading it way too nice. This is judgment. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. It is not for you to know justice. You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off of my people and their flesh from their own bones, who eat the flesh of my people and lay their skin from off them, and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. How do you think God feels about this? Right? You see a little uh, emphasis coming through here, don't you? Keep reading there. One more verse. Sorry, I interrupted. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face, his face from them at that time, because they have made their deeds evil. Okay, so you see the same kind of attention that Micah has now as he's directing his attention to the, it seems, the wealthy elite class of uh, in, in Judah. The heads of the rulers, and in chapter 3, um, down through uh, verse 12 in chapter 3, 1 through 12. In other words, heads, rulers, prophets, seers, priests, they're all addressed in this passage, and everyone who has influence over the people, they're all addressed. They're all in cahoots. They're all together in this. And this is judgment that the prophet Micah is addressing, just like Amos before. So as a result, Jerusalem will fall under judgment. So there at the end of chapter 3, verse 11 and uh, 12. Uh, let's see, Derek, why don't you read for us in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. Let's actually go up to verse 9. Let's get some good stuff there. You hear the, hear the voice of judgment coming through the prophet. He's speaking for the Lord. Do you have it? Chapter 3, verse 9. Oops. That's what we were looking at before. You need help? You need, you need to go on to somebody else? I'm not trying to get you in trouble or anything. We'll come back to you. Jason, do you have it? I got it. Okay. Starting in verse 9? Yes, sir. <laughs> you going to read it dramatically? Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, listen to me, you leaders of Israel. You hate justice and twist all that is right. You are building Jerusalem on a foundation of murder and corruption. You rulers make decisions based on bribes. You priests teach God's law only for a price. The prophets won't prophesy unless you're paid. Yeah, wow. all you claim is to depend on the Lord. No harm can come to us, you say, for the Lord is here among us. Because you, because of you, Mount Zion will be plowed like an open field. Jerusalem will be reduced to ruins. A thicket will grow on her heights where the temple now stands. Ooh, that's kind of uh, biting there. You see there, uh, it's, a, it's a financial enterprise. You see the reference there to, well, who's, on, who's only doing their job unless they get paid? But it's not even the job that needs to be done because they're all bent on doing things like bloodshed, violence, injustice. Uh, and, and notice the false sense of security. You remember we saw that before um, in uh, the, with, amongst the wealthy class of Israel. You remember, uh, they thought, Israel thought because of her religious religiosity, she was very busy having church and all of her you know, multiplying the, the sacrifices, multiplying the songs that she was writing as she was laying out on her couches, sprawled out and making up songs, singing about herself and her glory days. The Lord is obligated to bless us. We're wealthy because obviously he's blessing us. So who, are you, who do you think you are, Amos? It's the same kind of thing. This false sense of security. Notice it. Uh, Yet they lean on the Lord, Yahweh, saying, this is what they say, is not the Lord in our midst? Surely calamity or adversity, there's that same word, will not come upon us. Yes, it will. In fact, it's going to come first. 
because it's God's way of driving you to repentance before the good can come. So adversity here, we have exile and suffering before salvation, just like Isaiah. This is Micah's way of, of unpacking that theological truth. So judgment, Jerusalem will fall under judgment first and uh, before the, the good comes. Micah denouncing Israel or Judah or both in chapter 2. Well, Jerusalem, the, the city, capital city of Judah, he can refer to Judah, but referring to the whole southern nation, or refer to the capital city. You know, it's where the center of gravity is for the population at the time. But when Jerusalem falls, Judah falls. So, uh, Say that again. That you think it's, it's Paul's Paul's talking about by should we continue to sin because grace covers it by no means? Oh, you know, the same attitude. Oh yeah. Well, that's interesting. So shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? Yeah. That that idea. I don't know if it's the same because in in Micah's case, this is a group of people who are not getting the fact of their sin. I think they need to be called on the carpet with regards to the idolatry and you know their idolatry is the equivalent of what Hosea talks about with regards to harlotry and you know they're acting like a prostitute and they're walking out of their marriage, you know, going back into the red light district and you know we saw that Hosea the prophet goes into the red light district to find Gomer and bring her home, pay the price and you know sit here and start acting like my wife is what he says. You know, you need to start acting like my wife. I've stripped you away of all of your luxuries and all of your distractions, all of your access to all of the things that you were doing before. It's all gone. That's what happens in exile. So that's 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 the change agent. So God's that's the tough love that God has to, you know, his muscle that he has to to exert to to finally get the attention and bring them back. So answer your question so but there there's there's maybe a similarity in that the people of Judah and Jerusalem are taking advantage of the grace of God he's certainly being patient I mean after all this this tendency to syncretism and idolatry has been going on pretty much since the kingdom was established in Israel and Judah so this 400 year period a long time of Finally, God starts to rev up the prophetic voice, you know, still as a gracious move. He's, at least he's trying to get their attention, like the prophet Jonah, you know, building an ark and, hey, come here one more time. I'll explain it one more time, you know. Repent. You know. So would you, I know it's a dumb question to follow up to that, but would you say it's almost good theology to say that Yahweh does bring his people Yeah, he's uh, he's, and it's behind the fierceness sometimes that we see in the language that's used, like the lion attack that we saw in Hosea, there in uh, chapter four and five, there right in between. But we saw immediately that the repentance comes. You know, Hosea paints this picture: the lion who attacks. Why? It's because he's he's cut, he's obligated to attack. He wants to bring bring his prey into a place of isolation so that the repentance comes. Come, let us return to the Lord, is what, what Hosea says. So, so that's what we have. Now what we have in uh, Micah, just like what we saw with Isaiah, well, we read this before, but Micah 4, chapter 4 is a key chapter, 1 through 4. That's the announcement of the day of the Lord that we see. So this is eschatological Praise and encouragement for the faithful remnant. So we always see the prophets not losing track of the faithful remnant, which is always part of the audience, right? So there's a group, always a group of people while judgment... Sorry, you're on the wrong part of the room tonight. Judgment, judgment, judgment. Faithful remnant over here. Back to you guys. Just, just, just a gin and, and all you guys here. So yeah, the faithful remnant, you need to hear this. Day of the Lord's coming, and this is part of your future. So stay faithful. And that's what we have.
verse 5 in chapter 4, though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name. Remember, name means reputation. The fullness of the reputation of Yahweh, our God, forever and ever. That's our battle cry. That's kind of like, uh, you know, I keep coming back to it, but the chronicler and the end of his book, let him go up. You know, it's just the invitation that we have. Um, and who are the remnant? Who is going to be this faithful remnant on the day of the Lord? It's interesting. We've had this, you know, this, this continued repeated emphasis on, on the nations around, but notice who else is involved in verse 6. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the, the lame, I'll gather the outcasts, even those whom I've afflicted. I'll make the lame a remnant, and the outcasts a strong nation. And the Lord, Yahweh, will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on and forever. They're misfits. That's good news for us, isn't it? <laughs> now, these aren't saints. These aren't the sinlessly perfect people out there. They're just the normal Joes, the lame, the outcasts. They're going to be made up of this group that's re-emerging this rest, restored remnant. Um, and that's encouraging to us. Now, we're not done with Micah. Micah 5 begins with this contrast, I'll say, between two rulers or kings. So first, let's read verse 1 in Micah. Let's see. Uh, Oli Inca, could you read for us chapter 5, verse 1? Now gather yourself in truth, O daughter of troops. He has this sin against us. They will strike the judge of Israel, which are all on the cheek. Okay. Coming Messiah. Okay, good. So we see this first ruler or king who is here in this first verse going to experience humiliation. Uh, and it seems to be defeat uh, as a result of siege warfare, some kind of siege situation. You know, see the, the idea there, siege against us. Uh, but interestingly, in, and in contrast, now we move to verses 2 through 4. Could you continue reading, Olyanka? 2 through 4. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel. His great forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, you shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth, then the remnant of Israel brethren shall return to the children of Israel. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the end of the earth. All right. Thank you. Um, so in contrast, now we're going to have another uh, king, this is a, an interesting announcement because now we're linking it close, and this is obviously this, this prophecy that has huge implications for the first century church and the authors who are trying to unpack you know, the, all of the events that lead up to the birth of the Messiah, right? Where's this king going to come from? Bethlehem. Y'all see that. Um, what will this king do when he comes? Well, he'll rule over Israel. He'll bring about the return of his Brothers, a.k.a. the sons of Israel, they'll shepherd the flock, Israel, and be magnified to the ends of the earth. Which is pretty amazing. Herod is going to ask the religious experts of his day in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Let's just turn there. We have to keep turning to the New Testament when we have our opportunities. Matthew, what is it, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Michael's not here tonight. Ian, Ian, could you read for us? Chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and had come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it was written by the prophet, 
and you, O Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Okay, yeah, good. So there's the quote, there's the reference to the prophecy of Micah. And when King Herod is nervous, shaking in his shoes, worried about a, an opposing king who's coming out to take over and rally the people against him, he gathers his priests, his scribes, and all of the smart guys around. Where's this guy going to be? Where's this Messiah going to be born? And the answer is Bethlehem because of the prophecy of Micah. And it's interesting, we won't turn there, but wise men from the east, right? They know where to go, too, don't they? Is that right? Wise men who come in? Um, you know, they're kind of a mystery group, but they had their theology right, and they seemed to be aware of, of some of these aligning of the stars, right? No pun intended there. Um, when Samuel is instructed by the Lord to go and locate Israel's first, first true king, he's instructed to go to Bethlehem. 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 and verse 18. Um, so this is the picture of the Messiah who's coming, who's going to shepherd, who's going to function as a shepherd. And um, we see that uh, in other prophets that we'll be looking at. Let's turn to uh, Ezekiel chapter 34. So Ezekiel is also going to have this same beeline, the same divine um, vision. And in his discussion, Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Um, Ezekiel chapter 7, and then verse uh, 12. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among his scattered sheep, so I, this is again, I speaking Yahweh, I will care for my sheep, and I will deliver them from all the places to which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. And I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and Bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the streams, and in all the inhabited places of the, of the land. So this theology of the shepherd, what's the role of this coming one, this Messiah? Well, he's going to shepherd his people, gather them, bring them back to the land. Um, so now we go back to, uh, to Micah. Here we go, Micah. Micah chapter, uh, where were we, chapter over here in chapter 4, uh, and then verse 5. Um, no, we weren't there, were we? Yeah, chapter 5, verse 5. And this one will be our peace, again referring to the one who's coming, this one who will be born in Bethlehem. When the Assyrian invades our land, when he tramples on our citadels, then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight leaders of men. And they, uh, Let's see. So this is the one um, who refers to the previous verse, this reference to the one who will be born in Bethlehem, who will, who will come and establish, establish peace. All right, so we keep going here. So Micah ends with a strong focus on judgment, but also ends with this, I call it a doxology, of hope for the future. So first, the judgment. So we've seen this before. Remember I've discussed, especially with the prophet Amos, the covenant lawsuit idea. Uh, Amos was one that we looked at, the covenant lawsuit. So Amos was, you know, he knew the Bible of his day. He was well-versed in the teaching of Moses. So he builds his case against, in his case, Israel in the north based on the foundation of the, of the, of the, of the evidence that's available to him. And in the case of Micah, we have a similar situation. So the Lord is the prosecuting attorney. And the hills and the mountains and the foundations of the earth are called as witnesses. Those things that have been around for a long time. They're going to witness. And, and we have the first in chapter 6. The first evidence that's brought into the court of law. In chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. Let's see. Um, Kristen, could you read for us? Chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. What? Micah chapter 6, 3 through 5. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what, uh, 
Balak. Balak, uh, king of Moab, uh, devised. And what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from Shitham? Got to say that carefully. <laughs> Google that you may know the right, uh, the righteous acts of the Lord. Okay, so there's uh, an example. So this is going to, and you see the the subtleties here, but the big idea. Who is this God? You, you, you see, who is the one who ransomed you from the house of slavery under the leadership of Moses? So this is referring back to coming out of Egypt, right? Who is the one that saved you from Egypt? Who is the one that, and, and this reference to Balaam and, and Balak, that gets into the whole wilderness wandering. Who's the one that brought you all the way up to the plains of Moab? From Egypt to the plains of Moab. Who got you that far? You see? So that's an evidence that Micah is referring back to history. These are the events, the miraculous provision, the salvation, the rescue, and the provision through the wilderness all the way up through the end of when Moses hands the baton to Joshua. Who got you that far? Case and, you know, here's, here's the evidence, number one. And then what we have in uh, verses, uh, you know, really you might fill in the blanks, but Mike is asking this question. Have you forgotten Judah? Have you forgotten who this God is? So then we have evidence number two, chapter six, verses six through six through eight. And uh, let's see here. Kelsey, why don't you read for us? Chapter six, six through eight. With what shall I come with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, and to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Yeah, that's pretty good, isn't it? You see it? So evidence number two, and this describes here in some pretty intense language, you might say the misguided and multiplied religious activity of now Judah. We saw it before with uh, Hosea and Amos kind of addressed it there with, with regards to Israel. But now you've got the religious pride that sunk in. Look, and in, in, in the question, you know, shall... Uh, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God? So I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves. Does the Lord take delight in thousands and thousands and thousands of rams? No. Is it all about that? I mean, is that what you multiply to get God's, get the Lord's attention? No. He contrasts that and he says, no, it's to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Well, what about presenting my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? That's a subtle allusion to having church in the first church of Moloch, what Moses warned about, infant, sac infant sacrifice. That's the subtle allusion there. Is this true? He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. It's about the heart. That's what he says here in Chapter, uh, in verse 8b there. And, and humility, a walk of humility and of obedience, loving kindness, loving justice and the doing of justice. But you're not doing that, Judah. Um, Judah would have responded to this just like Israel. Hey, we're really busy spiritually. We're doing a lot of things for God. Isn't he obligated to bless us and protect us from the, the bad guys around the block? You know, And Micah, uh, Micah is saying no. No, you've got to you've got to focus on on the problem here, and uh, so Amos chapter yeah we we saw that in Amos chapter four verses four through five. So Micah gives a really good summary of what true religion looks like in verse eight, and we read that. Um, and because of Judah's relig religiosity, because of her pride of being very busy spiritually. She's become dull and hard of hearing. She's forgotten what is what needs to be true for the heart. So, all right, we're almost to the end here of Micah. And Michael is going to lament this. 
Micah chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. The prophet acknowledges, Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers and the grape gatherers. There's not a cluster of grapes to eat, or a first ripe fig, which I crave. The, the godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe, and a great man speaks the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright like a thorn hedge. The day when you post a watchman, your pursuit will come, and their confusion will occur. Do not trust in a neighbor. Do not have confidence in a friend. From, from her who lies in your bosom, guard your lips. For son treats father contemptuously. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. This is lament. This is crisis situation. And then we get to the very end. And like so many of the prophets before, Mike is going to turn to his soul that remembers. Remember the soul that remembers. Lamentations 3, verse 20 through 26. Um, Great is thy faithfulness. That's that part of Lamentations. We have a similar thing after the lament. Um, you know, these are, let's see, you know, laments like this in, in chapter 7 help move those who are part of the faithful remnant from grieving to hope. And uh, laments are helpful in transitioning from grief to hope and from judgment to salvation. Um, let's see. So in chapter 7, verse 7, uh, we see a similar transition um, like what we saw with Jeremiah in Lamentations. But as for me, what will we do? How should we respond? I will watch expectantly for the Lord, and I'll wait for the God of of my salvation, my God will hear me. So remember, we have adversity that comes before the good. Because of that, that equation, I'm going to have to wait. I'm going to have to wait for the good. But I'm going to have to endure and walk faithfully through the adversity. That's kind of what we have here in verse 8. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light. For me. So in the midst of this adversity, we never lose track of the Lord. We seek him for his guidance, for his direction. And then verse 9, I will bear the indign indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out of the light and I will see his righteousness. So that's kind of a, I have to deal with the fact that I'm, I'm a sinner. I've, I've I'm part of this. I've sinned against him, but it's you know I've got to wait for the the light of righteousness to shine again. And in turning to the Lord in humility and prayer, we see verse 14. Now the the request: Shepherd thy people with thy scepter, the flock of thy possession, which dwells by itself in a woodland in the midst of a fruitful field. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Um, I'll just keep reading it. In the days when you came up out of the land of Egypt, I will show you miracles. Nations will see and be ashamed of all of their might. They will put their hand on their mouth and their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like the reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses to the Lord our God. Uh, they will see, they will come in dread and they will be afraid before thee. So this is the idea of the activity of the shepherd in verse 14. And the Lord is acknowledged for his forgiveness and his unchanging covenant grace in verse 18 and 19. He will again have compassion on us, the prophet Micah says. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. Yes, thou, uh, thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's the forgiveness. Eventually it's going to happen in response to the repentance of his people. Verse 20. Thou wilt give truth to Jacob, and unchanging love to Abraham, which thou didst swear to our forefathers from the days of old. So, um, it's interesting that the reference there to Abraham goes 
goes back to the very beginning um, with regards to the unconditional promises that God had made. Uh, he's not ever going to let go of those unconditional promises. Well, let's get into a little bit of Nahum before we finish tonight. And uh, the prophet Nahum. So it's just the next page over. <clears throat> There's our deep thought picture for the book of Nahum. Now it's interesting the prophet Nahum uh, is, is really going to primarily uh, co uh, comprise of a series of judgment oracles against Nineveh, against Nineveh, Nineveh which is the capital city of Assyria uh, after 701 BC. And these oracles uh, probably were made just before the fall of Nineveh Nineveh is going to fall in 612 B.C., so in that time period. And you see at the very beginning, there's, no, there's nothing here except for Nahum being the uh, Elkoshite. There's not anything, any reference to kings, but we know that this is the basic time period that we have. And the idea of the oracle here in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, the idea of the oracle also can be translated, it means burden kind of a burden or some kind of weightiness. A weighty message is, is a nice way to think of, a, of an oracle. Um, and that comes from Nahum 1.1. 1, 1. Interestingly, we also, uh, you know, just like, you know, these are, like Jonah was from the north. Remember, he was one who also went to Nineveh. Um, so Nahum is the uh, from this area of Elkosh, which is, a city northwest of the Sea of Galilee. So interestingly, Nahum as a prophet is, is from the north. Um, he grew up in Israel, Nahum. Probably he grew up as a child during and, and maybe as a witness of the destruction of Samaria at the hands of the Assyrians. In fact, it, we're just speculating here, but he could have very well been part of a refugee group who escaped and then went down to Judah. And he finished growing up uh, in Judah after escaping the Assyrian takeover of Israel. You can picture him being a part of that and being interested as a prophet of uh, hearing from the Lord and helping everybody around know that the Assyrians have risen, but they're going to have their fall. They're eventually going to have their day of judgment. The Lord's not done with us because the Assyrians are going to have their day as well. There's a, that kind of brings a certain weightiness to the, these oracles against, the, against Nineveh. So probably, well, so basically Nahum is right on top of the Assyrian rise to power, its siege of Samaria, and again, the growing threat that we see, that we've already seen against Judah. So just a hundred years before Nahum, you know, we saw how God demonstrated grace towards the city of Nineveh in sending Jonah, the reluctant prophet, to preach repentance uh, there. Um, and we, we remember when we talked about Jonah, Jonah's real message or real prophetic ministry would have, would have probably occurred when he got back to uh, Israel and preaching the message of, well, what God did there needs to happen here. Remember, we talked about that. So now Nahum is called by God to deliver a message of judgment against Nineveh, but from Judah. So that now he's down in Judah, and he's preaching this prophetic message of judgment against um, Nineveh. Judah. So this message, how did it get to um, it's intended for Judah. Oh, it's just intended. I don't think that we have any uh, re uh, evidence to suggest, like Jonah, Nahum ever met, made his way to Nineveh. It's, it's a, the oracles of judgment against Nineveh intended for Judah. That's what I think what we can say. So we can maybe uh, date Nahum as an active prophet in and around the time of King Manasseh in Judah. But we have to understand Nahum's oracles of a judgment against Assyria were extremely politically incorrect. Politically incorrect. At the time of Nahum's oracles, Israel was uh, being governed by these Assyrian overlords. Manasseh was paying tribute to maintain a political alliance with Assyria. 
So to preach a message from Judah at that time would have been considered treason, political treason. But we have to understand Nahum's not being politically correct here. Uh, he's going to begin his oracle, as we see here, uh, unpacking uh, who is God? Who is this God? Uh, let's see. Verse 2. Um, verse 2. He's a jealous and avenging God. A jealous and avenging God is Yahweh. Yahweh is avenging and wrathful. Yahweh takes vengeance on his ad adversaries. And he reserves wrath for his enemies. This is who we're talking about. Um, what is he jealous over? Um, he's jealous over his people. He's jealous over his segula, Exodus 19, 1 through 5. Here's a, a kind of a way of looking at the Hebrew and reorganizing this message a little bit. In the Hebrew, there's emphasis given. A God of jealousy um, and one who takes vengeance is Yahweh. One who takes vengeance is Yahweh, a master of wrath. One who takes vengeance is Yahweh toward his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Yahweh, long-suffering in anger, great in strength, and by no means will he clear the guilty. Yahweh, in a whirlwind and a storm is his way, and clouds are the dust of his feet. We see similar language here that parallels Exodus 34 in uh, how God is, how the Lord is described. Nahum is borrowing this language, and he brings two things with emphasis. Jealousy as it relates to the vengeance or wrath of the Lord. It's repeated four times, as you can see. And the fact that God is Yahweh, five times it's referred to. This is his covenant name, of course, and it's Yahweh who's acting here. So the covenant context is taken very seriously we're dealing here with a jealous spouse. This is a, a husband who's come home only to discover that his bride, his special treasure, his segula, is sleeping in bed with someone else. Right? This is why he's so jealous. This is why he's, 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 he's acting in, in vengeance. Judah, uh, Nahum, the prophet Nahum is reminding Judah of the God who they're married to. Covenant relationship. So this is kind of a, uh, a little bit of, of what we have going on. This is the same God who demonstrated 100 years of grace to the Ninevites. I'm sorry, yeah, before judgment. Um, well, let me say it a little bit differently. If Jonah planted the seeds of judgment and repentance for the Ninevites. What did they do with that over the over the hundred year period from Jonah now to the time of Nahum? Um, what have they done uh, with that? So we'll see that in a little bit and, and we'll see what the Assyrians, the kind of nation that the Assyrians have become. And there's some description there that we'll see in these oracles of judgment that Nineveh has against the Assyrians. They become brutal as a nation. Bloodthirsty, and they have become a nation. Uh, their religion has, had become, or over time became, a religion of violence. They were brutal. They were the, they were the worst of the three. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, and the Persians. The Persians were the nicest. Babylonians were a little nicer, but the Assyrians, you didn't want to mess with them. They were mean to the core. So this is part of the thrust of this message behind the oracle of judgment against Nineveh. Uh, but really, parallel to this is that we have to remind ourselves that Nahum is preaching these oracles of judgment in Judah, in the south. So as Judah you know, is hearing these oracles, we're going to see how the prophet Nahum also brings now the judgment message uh, against Judah as well. Um, this is Judah's wake-up call um, for the prophet Nahum. Nahum is going to ask a double-sided question in verse 6. Um, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure 
the burning fire of his anger. His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up before him. Who can stand up against the flood of indignation? Oh, I've got a little bit of an example here. Just the, this was like, a, I think, the result of an of a earthquake that happened out in the ocean. So this would be called a, a tsunami that comes in. It just a, shows you how quickly, how quickly the waters come. Yeah, you don't want to be caught in this. You don't want to be that guy. So you can see, it's a flood of indignation that's coming. And uh, that's the question that Nahum asked to the Assyrians. Uh, you know, They've grown up as one of the world's superpowers. They're known for their brutality and their military boasting. And the answer is, for Judah, it's not the Assyrians. They're not going to be able to stand up against this flood of judgment. So Judah is hearing these words too, as the prophet Nahum is, is addressing um, is addressing Judah, and we have to kind of keep track. Follow the bouncing ball. Judah, Judah's made up of two groups at this time. We, we've talked about this before. The righteous remnant, uh, which is the minority. The righteous, the faithful remnant, I should say. Not the righteous remnant, but the faithful remnant. And the unfaithful, the majority of Judah. So this is, again, the same audience that we saw have, have been seeing here with Micah and, and Isaiah. So... We're going to see and expect to see things like this. Breaks in the cloud, and for the faithful remnant, Nahum is going to have some brief words of encouragement. We see that in verses 7 and 8 in chapter 1. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight. And will pursue his enemies into the darkness. So the question that Nahum asks, who can stand, who can stand from verse 6 before this judgment, before his indignation? Who can endure the burning fire of his anger and the wrath that's coming? Who can endure this? What's the answer? Well, the answer is the faithful remnant. That's who can stand against it. Um, we see a similar thing uh, take place in, uh, in the prophet Habakkuk. Uh, Nahum is going to parallel Habakkuk with regards to this encouragement strategy for the faithful remnant. In other words, if I'm, I'm in Judah and I'm starting to see this picture that, you know, hey, what happens to Nineveh could happen to Jerusalem unless we get our act together. Um, how do the faithful respond? And uh, with the prophet Habakkuk, just one, one, one prophet over, in chapter 3, verse 19, we'll look at this again. But I like this picture. I'm just going to end with this tonight. The Lord God is my strength. Here's how the prophet Habakkuk encourages the faithful remnant. And he has made my feet like hinds feet, and he makes me walk on my high places. Hinds feet for high places. That's a description of the faithful remnant and what they do and how God has uniquely prepared them to endure the challenges and difficulties of what it would be like if you were called to walk around on these jagged cliffs. Well, there actually is a specially designed and very unique sheep that has hind feet, a specially designed foot that allows them to hop around on these very dangerous crags, these, these rocky crags. So I just want to show you this and kind of give you a glimpse of what Habakkuk was, was bringing in as a visual display or, or a, a, a kind of an illustration of what the faithful remnant looks like. They look like this. 
Across the globe, mountain goats are the ultimate mountaineers. They can pick their way across near vertical cliffs, find impossible routes up and down rocky crags, daintily tackling terrain that for most animals and for us would be lethal. They face some of the most adverse weather conditions and they inhabit some of the most inaccessible rock faces. These mountain goats really do live their lives on the edge. Here on the Great Orm in North Wales, these Kashmiri mountain goats can make it to places that other grazing animals can't reach, feasting on the lush grass tucked into crevices and crags. They do it with such ease and such confidence, and the fact that there's a massive 50 metre drop into the Irish Sea below just doesn't seem to bother them in the slightest. Oh, there's another one. These guys are some of the most sure-footed animals on Earth. <laughs> Baby mountain goats have to catch on quick. Just days after birth, they make this treacherous terrain their playground. Sharp, cloven There's the hind feet right there. The Those are specially designed feet. And strong legs power them up the mountainside. Okay, so there's the picture of, that's who can stand against the coming tide of judgment, the flood of judgment that's coming. It goes back to what we've seen, the adversity's coming before the good. So the adversity, right, you see the picture, what are the faithful remnant doing? Well, according to Habakkuk, and, and I think in, in parallel with Nahum and Micah and all the other prophets, it's the hind's feet. God gives the faithful remnant what they need to endure the adversity and wait patiently for the good that's coming and is promised because that's what we see the prophets doing. So that's a great picture. It always encourages me when I see those, those goats. And they, by the way, are with an eye view of Jerusalem. In other words, they're around the area. So they're, everybody would have known, oh yeah, those are the goats that do those amazing things running around the, the jagged crags of the cliffs in and around Jerusalem, and, and uh, we're, God's saying that we're to be like them. You know? So this was a great sermon illustration, you might say. All right, well, thanks for your patience tonight. We'll pick up, uh, I'll have some more words to say about the final exam. Look for the study guide. Um, we'll get ready over fall break, and you'll have uh, another full week, really, after fall break to get prepared. And the window, the test window, will be right at the end of the week, kind of over the weekend, and we'll get that nasty midterm out of the way. I think everybody will do great. Just, just we won't be doing fall break. No, not during fall break. We, we, we have a full week of fall break, and then we come back for a full week of class. We'll meet one more time in class, actually, but that material won't be on. That week's lecture won't be on. We'll go up to this point in the lecture for the content for the midterm. So everybody good with, good with that? But I'll, I'll clarify that in my study guide that you'll get. All right, thanks.